Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the St. Charles County Council meeting of 2009, uh, of, of September 9th, 2019. This evening, giving our invocation will be Reverend Debbie Bartley from the St. Charles United Methodist Church. And after that, Terry Hollander will give us, do the pledge. Everybody rise. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we convene tonight, we ask for your presence in our lives, and especially during this evening's meeting. Give to this council guidance and wisdom so that they can stand in the gap for their constituents and for this great county. Our world appears to be so divisive on so many important, crucial issues. We fail to fully listen to each other, and we fail to give grace to each other. May tonight's conversations and decisions be made with careful and with thoughtful discernment. Protect those who protect us, our county's law enforcement, first responders, and all employees who selflessly serve to meet our basic needs. Send your blessings upon our county executive, the members of this council, and all those serving in St. Charles County governance. May they continue to be instruments of hope and instruments of peace for all the people of St. Charles County. With grateful hearts we pray, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a roll call. Councilmember Joe Cronin. Councilmember Joe Brazel. Here. Councilmember Mike Elam. Here. Councilmember John White. Here. Councilmember Dave Hammond. Here. Councilmember Terry Hollander. Here. Thank you, Donna. Uh, at this time, we have a public presentation on how the St. Charles County Election Authority works with the uh, director, Kurt Barr. Welcome, Mr. Barr. Thank you. All right, you got my slides. So, uh, a couple weeks back, I was presenting these uh, slides to a uh, another social gathering and uh, Councilman Elam said that he thought that the information would be uh, useful to the, uh, the council. And so I went ahead and just made a few modifications to it to provide a few more details for you guys. And this is pretty much the presentation. All right, so the first thing I like to uh, uh, make note to uh, people I go out and talk to is just how large our county is in terms of voting. We have 266,000 registered voters in our county, which makes our county the third largest uh, election district in the state. We actually are larger than St. Louis City when it comes to the number of voters. We currently have 122 precincts. Um, it was 121. Uh, if you recall, in, in Wentzville, we had a very large precinct. We had very long lines. And so we figured out a nice way of dividing that precinct between Council Districts 1 and 2 and using uh, Quail Ridge uh, Park as a polling place. And so we split those that, that precinct in half. So now we have 122 precincts. Currently, we have uh, 115 locations. I'm reducing that by nine for next year. Uh, mostly what I've been working on doing is eliminating elementary schools as polling locations. Uh, primarily it's for school safety for the students you know these are the obviously the, the younger students but also just convenience of the voters uh, po uh, elementary schools have um, insufficient parking for voting and really typically they don't have a good location to vote inside so if you see we have currently we have 53 churches that we use as our polling places um, I'm going to decrease that by three unfortunately uh, we have used 33 schools. We're actually decreasing that by 11. Almost all of those are elementary schools and a couple middle schools. And then uh, we use about uh, 17 other public buildings. That's uh, most of the city halls, the libraries, uh, quite a few of the public parks, the city and, and county parks. And then uh, we have 15 private buildings. That'd be like Lions Club, Knights of Columbus, those types of halls. And so that is where our, our people go to vote on election day. And then on any given election, we have between 100 and 250 different ballots. In August election, it gets to be even more than that simply because of the party split. We have to have the same ballot in multiple parties. 
Um, so that's in, in, in you know the high level what the, uh, the voting looks like. Election Authority Office. We have 15 FTE. Currently, I'm lapsing two. This is a slow time in our office, and so I'm waiting a little while before I go ahead and hire. I'll certainly fill them by next year because with the uh, four elections and the big presidential election, we'll need those people at that point in time. On an, any given period coming up to leading up to an election, we hire about 10 full-time temps that serve in the election authority for about six weeks uh, leading up to an election. These are the people who process the absentee voters as well as the people who work in the warehouse to make sure all the logistics and stuff for an election work. On election day, I hire almost 800 election judges. Uh, that number is going to go down hopefully a little bit with this reduction in number of polling places, um, which is one of the biggest uh, needs I have is to recruit and train new judges because every year people, you know, you know they, you know, life changes, they don't want to do it anymore, so constantly looking for, for new judges. Um, the election authority has a payroll of just under $900,000, and we have an operating budget of only 57000 About over half of that is postage. I spend a lot of money in postage. Now, I'm working on, fi um, on a, a way of actually reducing the postage cost. Uh, there's a couple things that the election authority office is allowed to do that other government offices aren't allowed to do, and so I'm pursuing those uh, those things, and so we're looking at actually decreasing our postage costs next year. So here is the cost of elections. Uh, an election at countywide level costs between five and six hundred thousand uh, dollars. So that's that's the overall cost. So next next year we're going to have four elections. So we're going to be spending you know o well over a million dollars just running elections uh, next year. Now. Last year, when I was still a state representative, we passed some legislation that said that the state needs to pay their fair share of elections that are state-caused, the March presidential preference primary being one of those. There is uh, appropriation from the current General Assembly for uh, reimbursement to our county for that. The amount is still to be determined. The Secretary of State's office is to set a, a, a schedule, a repayment schedule on that, and I don't know exactly how much it's going to cost, but it's going to cost our, our county about $500,000 to run that election, and you know, hopefully we'll get a good portion of that back. April elections are, are paid for by the political subdivisions that have it, so the, the cities, the school boards, and fire boards, whatever, who uh, run that election. So April elections usually don't cost the county anything unless the county puts something on the ballot. It is the August-November elections that the county pays the, you know, the lion's share. But where does all that money come from? Or, or what do we spend it on? Those 800 people that I hire for one day spend almost $100,000 paying our election judges. Um, ballots, printing the ballots and paying our vendor to help us print ballots, again, another $100,000. Uh, the notification cards, those little red and white cards that we send out letting people know that they're, they're going to vote, that alone is $70,000 to mail to countywide. And that's, uh, again, I'm working on uh, decreasing that because most of that cost is postage. Um, and then we have a number of software systems that we use to, to run elections. Um, temps over time can cost 35000 State law requires that I have to publish twice in the newspaper the sample ballot. Um, and so that, you know, that is $20,000. It's actually cheaper this year because we stopped using the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Their rates were quite a bit higher than community news. Um, and then uh, polling place rentals. So of the private locations that we use, the, the churches and the private buildings, I have to pay a rental fee. Mm -hmm. And that comes up to close to $17,000 for each election. Uh, we spend $11,000 just to deliver all of the stuff to the 115 locations that we have. And then there's quite a few miscellaneous costs. And then the question that most people jokingly ask, or maybe not so jokingly ask, is, well, what does the election authority do when you're not running an election? And so it's kind of like asking a pastor, what does he do when he's not Sunday? Um, and the reality is, an election takes five months to administer. So the April election will begin this December when candidates start to file. And then after you have the, the filing of the candidates, then we have to start creating the ballots. And then we have to proof them, make sure that they're, they're correct. Correct. We have to continuously recruit judges all the time, train judges for each election. We have to coordinate with all of our polling places, make sure that you know, a, a private polling place doesn't quit on us and say go find somewhere else, which has happened in the past. Um, 
the other things that we have to do is uh, you know, send out that mailer as well as the newspaper notification. And so all of these things and then the, uh, the wrap up, the, the certification of the election and then you know, cleaning up all of our, our equipment, maintaining it, uh, fixing what's broken, replacing what was damaged or, or used during the election, all that's a, a five month process and we'll have four elections next year. And so the other question that most people ask me is, so what have you, been, what have you done in your first eight months in, in office? And the first several things I worked on was uh, focusing on technology. Um, we updated the software system that we use to manage our polling locations and our, our judges so we can track uh, our training of them, our, our paying of them, uh, making sure that they get put in the right location so every uh, polling place has the right number of judges. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is uh, we, we bought uh, new iPads for the poll, the poll books so, so that when uh, uh, people come in to register to vote, um, we can look them up. All of those now are, are cellular, which provides an interesting element of security within um, the, uh, the election process, is that if you come in to absentee vote, not, you know, now that all my iPads are cellular, I can make sure that the supplemental file is pushed out to all those iPads so that you know, that short little window of when I program the iPads and, and you know, when the election day happens, if you vote in that little window of time, if, you know, if the, uh, air, if the internet doesn't pr upload to the, uh, the poll books, then the, the judges there wouldn't know. And so, so it was a element of security that we were able to fix by making sure that I can update all of my poll books on election day and know that they all got updated. The other thing it allows me to do is to be able to better manage our election. So if any precinct is running low on ballots, I'll know even before the election judges know because I can you know, watch the software and they'll tell me, hey, you're short on this ballot. And so we can send out ballots to the polling place if for whatever reason they're running low. Um, some other things we're working on, a lot of training for the staff. Uh, we're updating our software and so obviously we're working on training our staff on that software. Secretary of State's office provides some uh, webinars and so we've been utilizing all of those webinars Secretary of State's office provides. And then just changing our processes and our procedures and just making sure that we are uh, you know, mission focused with, with elections. Um, and then being the new guy, I have the luxury of being able to question everything. So why do we do it? Why is, why is it that way? Is it that way because it's the best practice? Is it that way just because we've always done it that way? And, and then uh, we just got our uh, audit from the uh, county auditor and uh, he gave us some uh, very good recommendations of how we can to continue to improve our process. And so we'll be, uh, I'm actually, I just got the uh, report today from him, and so I'll be uh, you know, making my comments and we'll be working on improving our process even more with, with his comments. But where I, every time I go and speak to any group of people, I always have two things I ask for. And the, the number one thing is just that need for election judges. Again, we have 115 locations that we man, or we'll have uh, 106 next year. And we need over 700 uh, judges, depending on how big the election is. For the November <laughs> election, it will still need probably 750 people to man the, the November election. And so everywhere I go, I say we need election judges. We've been working with the, the county <laughs> IT and the communications departments to um, uh, get new brochures, new flyers, new information, put on the, uh, the county website our, and the county Facebook page, our, our website talking about here's how you can apply to become an election judge. Um, I even brought a few extra uh, flyers with me that I can uh, hand out. If you guys know anybody who would like to serve as an election judge, that is you know, an easy way to be part of the electoral process, be part of the democratic process without having to actually put your name on the ballot. And the other thing is a, just a quick reminder to, to all voters, we need to make sure that everybody's voter registration is up to date. Even if you move, say you live out in Wentzville and you live north of 70, well, you're in County Council District 1. You move south of 70, you're in County Council District 2. Well, that's two different ballots. And so you may only move a quarter mile, but you've moved political subdivisions. And so anytime anybody moves, you know, we need them to give us a updated voter registration file so that we can update their system. Because I can't simply change a voter's record without their signature and their written permission to update their, their uh, voter file. And so it's just spread the word. Anytime you know anybody's moving, just say, hey, have you updated your voter registration? Because that'll allow us to process them 
at the polling place more quickly so that everybody's experience is you know, quicker, easier, you know, and more helpful. And so those are the two big asks that I, I go anytime I uh, am out presenting, is we need more judges, always need more judges, and want people to register. And I have plenty more material I could talk about, but that's the, the, the short and sweet uh, presentation that I generally give anytime I go out into the public. Uh, Councilman Elam had said it was uh, something he thought that the, the rest of the council would be appreciative to hear. And so I don't know if you do a question and answer or if you would like me to relinquish my little clicker. Any questions? I just wanted to thank Kirk because um, I know he's been getting out in the county and He's gone to chambers and things like that, and I just wanted to give him an opportunity to come in, and I know it's tough to find people to do election day, and he's working on a couple of different ways to try to make it easier to be an election judge, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to come uh, talk about that. And I don't know how many people realize how much money goes into an election. They think that, oh, we just throw an election, and it happens. And kind of like you said, you know, what do you do when there's not an election? Well, there's a lot that goes into it, and I guarantee you the majority of the public has no idea about that and I would bet most people would not bet that it's going to cost you half a million dollars to run an election. So I just think that's something a lot of times people say where did our money go when they're talking about government. So it's always good to do an opportunity to inform people as to where their money goes and how much this stuff costs um, just so they're informed. So I appreciate you yeah. letting Kirk come in and speak and I appreciate you getting out in the community and making these presentations. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you Director Barr. Next on our agenda is a public hearing for uh, traffic regulations. Is anybody to speak on that? John Conover. Mr. Chairman, do you, would you like Craig Tykowski to explain the process? Yes, I would you? like that. I didn't see him back here. Tonight is the first of two public hearings that will be held. Uh, the next one is at the next council meeting. Um, following uh, the public hearings, we'll, we'll go out and look at each of the requests, evaluate them, um, and then come back to you with a recommendation on whether or not we believe uh, they should be adopted. And it will be presented to you in the form of a draft ordinance, which will be up to you for a final approval. Very good, all right. Is anybody here for the traffic hearing? John Conover. Can I come up there? Yes. Oh. First time doing this. So I don't know if you have the PDF doc document or if it's going to show up there. Um, we're here with the Sedona neighborhood, and we live off uh, Teresa Fields. Can you Fields. speak in the microphone? Sure. We're here with uh, Sedona, and we're a 63-unit um, neighborhood up in Lake St. Louis. And we live on, on one small street called Teresa Fields and, and some connecting courts to it. Um, we connect to a specific interest, ent entrance, Country Landing Drive, which is a private road that comes in off an inn, and then it turns into to County Road and, and Teresa Fields. Um, if you go into, and really, really the reason we're here is, is the extreme danger that it presents to all the residents that live on the road due to the high traffic. There's been a lot of homeowner damage in regards to mailboxes being hit. Um, it's extremely unsafe. And if I think if you go to the map, it'll kind of paint a picture or the next, or I scroll down. I don't know if I have access. Do I have access here? Yes, there. No. There you are. It's oh, up. okay. It's up. So, so this country landing drive right here is the private drive that comes to right here, right? And it's all asphalt. And then it turns in from here. But if we go up a little bit, you'll see that it intersects right here with N before it gets to Briar Chase, and then, and then an owl, an official lighted entrance that goes into um, the Lake St. Louis Boulevard that goes through down to Shady Creek and, 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 and the next road joining up with it. So if we get down on this road, just to kind of paint the, the issue that we're coming into here, and here it's a little bit better of that picture here, you can see where the asphalt meets, is back in 2018 and on September, we had a report and traffic was monitored um, of over 4.2 days, and we've collected a total amount of 3,069 cars traveling in one direction. And this entrance or exit was purposely built for construction. It was the original road to the first subdivision that was there. And, and some of the, the original homeowners that are here today were even told, like, hey, it's, the intent is to close it down afterwards. And, 
um, but it never was. And then we've had conjoining neighborhoods, very large ones that have come to us that have increased the amount of traffic that uh, just find this road to be more convenient. So when we talk about an entrance, it was never built to sustain the road traffic and the amount of cars that we see. Again, this is 3,000 cars traveling north and not counting the return traffic. So a safe estimate might be you know, 1,000 cars a day that go up and down our, our road. Um, the road is very narrow. It's only 24 feet wide. So if we have one car parked in the road, it causes jams and, and can be dangerous for, for any kids, which there are plenty 20 plus kids and bus stops on, on our street. And then I have provided some, some damage on the road constrict, or, or to the road that's coming to, due to traffic. So on Teresa Field Lanes, you can see the road deterioration that's gonna come and, and consistently be more expensive and as cars continue to use it. Some additional pictures here. And then also to Country Landing, which is only 16 to 18 feet wide. And this is the private portion of, of the land, which our subdivision is the only subdivision that has easement rights to use this private drive. And you know, again, to do construction. And none of the surrounding neighborhoods actually have those easement rights to, the, to this, to this uh, private drive. On this private drive here, you can see how dangerous the entrance is to in and, and off with, with you know, large uh, gaps and boulders and potholes. And, and I'm sure you guys, if you've looked up any complaints done, there's been actually quite a few complaints submitted to, to the county on Country Landing about the, the condition. Um, the, the farmer who owns the land, the Rhodes family, is responsible for, I believe, for the upkeep on this particular road. Right, so it's not that the HOA's responsibility to fix this road, and, and it's kind of in this gray area. So actually, and coming up to this first picture, and I should have, have listed the county, is we have just St. Charles County has got this nice little rectangle of land that encompasses this Teresa Fields, and then everything else around the areas are Lake St. Louis and O'Fallon, I believe. Um, so it's kind of like who's responsible, who's not responsible, and, and we're looking for guidance on what we need to do to shut the entrance down. And the reason why we f feel that it's viable in today's landscape is come down, and this is kind of our proposed solution, is either putting a fence halfway through here so uh, garbage trucks and service vehicles can turn around at the dead end, or that we block it off here, and then the Rhodes family's home that's here can, can use Teresa Fields as an exit. Since the construction of our neighborhood, this is the new entrance that comes down uh, from Lake St. Louis Boulevard. And then we have another entrance that's coming down through Liberty School that will, will connect with Somers. This is not including the extra or other entrances that were intended and built originally out of Briar Chase to handle the traffic. In addition, in Country Shire, there are two other exits. And then if we go out the other way down Shady Oak and Palmer on. Sure. What's that? Any point on that? No, go back. Down. Yes. Where that you want to close? So actually, the close would be right here, where this cursor is. In some some short of fashion, just kind of the street ends in this dead end here, and so, in some particular way, we would like to shut it down right there. And this way, there are two homes. Well, there's three homes in the original deal of the the farmer that uh, in the Rhodes family. There's a, a Reinhold Electric, which is a commercial, and then there's two resident homes here and here, which still have access to their private drive to, to get out on end. I did speak to the Rhodes family and, and a couple of months ago, and while it's not ideal of him wanting to come down through our neighborhood and, and get the double D, he, he did say that he's, he's tired of the traffic, and, and I believe that he's responsible for the litter and has received fines and, and all kinds of, of things for it and pays taxes for the road. So. So yeah, I don't know what else to do, <laughs> but we're all really nervous for our kids, you know, just getting out, uh, cutting my grass, almost got hit by cars. I mean, you can kind of go into the specifics of, of not being considerate and speed and stuff like that, but we need something to be done for, for the safety of, of the residents in our neighborhood. Yes. Is there, you're saying that asphalt road, that's the, that's the Rhodes family original entrance, right? That's correct. Now, do they want it closed down? They do. Yeah, so, so, and that's just, that's just conversation that I've had with, with Mr. Rhodes, and he's the last one there, and the other two, the one with the Reinhold commercial and, the, and then the resident behind him, um, in, in my conversation with him, is saying that they, they were two brothers that had moved out. I believe that there were six 
initial members of the Rhodes family that, that participated in the deal, but he is the last one um, that remains in, in the property. And in addition to that, so if we come up here, excuse me, to my little marked up diagram. So his driveway is right here, it's gravel. And even if we put a fence halfway into the road here where it gives, gives enough uh, room for service vehicles, we still have this easement of grass here that measures about 12 feet that, that his private drive could actually still extend to. So even if we did block it off from Teresa, he could technically still use it as his driveway to get out the private lane. So depending on, on you know, how we rule or what we wanna do in regards to where we mark it down, there are, there are several options. That's it. I'm all done? All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Michael Conant. He's asleep. He's probably carrying over. John? No. Okay. Good evening. I'm here to speak about the other two uh, locations on this uh, on your agenda. The one uh, Restricted parking for handicap only at 2613 Plantation Point. I am the uh, president of the board for the uh, patio home association. Both of these are in heritage patio homes. Uh, this one here, uh, I'm sorry to say that the gentleman has deceased. Mm. So there would be no, no, no need any longer for this uh, handicap parking on Plantation Point. The board has also uh, agreed with the homeowner that uh, at 26, uh, 29 Hampton Road, it is a handicapped lady who uh, is legally blind and has uh, some uh, also other health problems. And she has people that come and pick her up to take her to for groceries and so forth and take her to doctor's appointments. Now that one there, I'm a little confused and maybe we did this wrong because it's saying prohibit parking but this is a handicapped lady also so i don't know if at this point if that can be something that somebody would look at but both of these were handicapped individuals both 26 29 hampton road and of course the other one the gentleman's deceased so it's not needed any longer uh, the board has said that they they agree because they're both handicapped people and that's all i had to say that you know our board's in agreement Right. Any questions or? Uh, so I believe is it Constance who is the one who is requesting that other handicap for the uh, for the lady who that you were speaking of who's blind? Yeah. So the board May is in Mayhem? favor of. I'm sorry, Mayhem. Yes, ma'am. So the uh, sir. So the board is in favor of approving that handicap spot in front of the the blind lady's home. Yes, sir. Cool. Okay. okay. I appreciate that. And then the other one, like I say. I'm sorry to say the gentleman is deceased. Correct. All right. All right. Well, Mr. Kowski will look at it and advise us on what to do. Thank, Thank you. you very much Thank for you. coming. Have a nice evening. Nathaniel Shrimp. Uh, I also wanted to speak in support of the closure of Teresa Fields Lane. Okay. Um, I'm one of the original owners on the property or on the street mm -hmm. when the house was built the traffic was much much lower and Pleasure. with the surrounding subdivisions preston woods country shire uh the other one um <laughs> they've it, it's increased a lot of traffic um i've personally had to replace my mailbox three times from being hit it's been hit more those were just the people that stopped and paid for the mailbox um, I've been hit, almost hit several times mowing the grass. Um, it's just, it's too narrow of a road to have this much traffic going through there. Um, so, yeah, that's really all I had. Thanks. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Dan Basile. Distinguished council members, thank you for uh, putting the road closure uh, for Teresa Fields Lane on the agenda. My name's Dan Basil, and I'm a resident of Teresa Fields Lane. Uh, as has been outlined uh, by two folks, Teresa Fields Lane is an increasingly dangerous route 
to pedestrians and drivers, uh, which have and will cause accidents, uh, including my mailbox uh, last year. Uh, so there's really a few factors that make this road really dangerous. So a couple's been outlined, so I won't go through those. Um, but the road is really curvy on an x-axis and a y-axis. So it really, um, there's a lot of blind spots and really reduces the amount of time that drivers have to re react. And uh, you know, be mindful that the speed limit is 20 miles per hour. And with the curves, it really doesn't give the drivers a lot of time to react. Um, as has been outlined, the traffic is staggering. So I'm a certif certified statistician. Um, this is the first time I'm seeing the data. But every time looking outside, there's around three to four cars uh, on the road at a time. Um, so in a 30 second span, so just extrapolate that. Um, and the, the number's already been outlined. Uh, the access route is a driveway with frequent potholes. Uh, so that country landing, um, if you hit those potholes at a wrong angle, really easily to go off angle uh, and hit an oncoming vehicle. And uh, there's many children that live on the road. Um, so as an Army officer, I was taught uh, risk management. And I've been kind of going through the risk and how to mitigate those risks. And I really can't find anything um, other than really closing down the road. Um, but finally, kind of any counter argument, I've tried to think about it of not closing the road. And I really haven't been able to find something um, that would be safe. Um, it's really no inconvenience, at least to myself, of shutting down that road. There's a lot of other accesses that um, I can go to. Um, and uh, there's also the uh, road opening on Paul Renaud uh, to Liberty High School. Um, so plenty of access, as I explained, there's the easement, so if emergency vehicles need to get through, um, there's no issue. Thank you for your time. <coughs> Thank you. Arnie Dinoff. Thank you very much, members of the County Council. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, public advocate and resident. And first of all, as I testified the last public hearing on traffic, we really need to change the way that uh, this process needs to be more comprehensive and more transparent. Just looking at the face value and preparing for tonight's meeting, when I looked at it, in the County Council packet, this is all that you get, one-liners. They don't even tell you what neighborhood, what region of the county, what subdivision of the county. Now I had to do some of my own homework to come to some of the uh, data, and I heard from some of the data, some of the requesters. But wouldn't that be putting the cart before the horse? And wouldn't Mr. Trotkowski and the county highways and administration want to put this information to be transparent and be forthcoming for the public to participate in public hearings? Um, public participation is very important to me and the rest of the county. In the information packet, it was so lacking with only one sentence as I just stated. There was no background, there was no in-depth, detailed information. Um, why wasn't this information and data that was presented by the presenters given to the county clerk staff or the county council staff to put in your packets? Um, the photos, the exhibits uh, would have been of help here. Um, there needs to be the petition and the supporting documents as they were submitted to the county uh, in terms of being transparent and open with the public. Now, prohibited parking was asked for at 2613 Plantation Point, uh, restricted parking to handicapped parking only. Uh, that's now been, I guess, uh, asked to be uh, taken off the agenda. But I had to do my own in-depth to find out exactly what we're talking about. And I finally found out that it's in the vicinity of uh, Missouri 94 and 364, zip code is 63306. It's a condominium neighborhood in the heritage landing area of our county. Um, we, as one of the largest growing counties in the nation, can do much better, especially in this case, uh, and have a much more open process. Our county needs to come up with a much more better way to ensure compliance with Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA. There are all kinds of uh, non-compliance issues countywide that need to be addressed. We need to be proactive, improving access and crossings, and pedestrian, uh, improve pedestrian safety, improve wheelchair compliant access, signal crossing enhancements, tones for the deaf, braille for ones who cannot see, even safe ramps for those who are confined in wheelchairs. My belief is that everyone shall have the same exact equal access 
to cross any road in St. Charles County as I or anybody that's able-bodied sitting behind me. The second one that's on the agenda is prohibited parking um, in front of 2629 Hampton Road. And I looked it up and it came up as unit number D. Again, this is a condominium association. It was Heritage Leaning Subdivision at 94 and 364. <laughs> None of this information was provided beforehand. Um, it would be nice to make sure that, that happens in the future. And finally, the road closure request at uh, County Leaning Drive at Teresa Fields Lane. You know, I had questions, where was this? Initially, I tried to find out where it was. I came up with Riverside Landing next to our park in North St. Charles County or the Wentzville area where there's a Teresa Fields Lane. But it's, as we heard tonight, Sedona uh, subdivision off of Highway N in the city of, or abutting the city of Lake St. Louis. Now the county cannot intrude or impede and make decisions on private roads. That would be against the state statute and the constitution. We need to provide and make sure that equal access is given to private property. And I caution the county staff to check with the county counselor to make sure that we avoid a lawsuit at all costs in this case. Private property and residences uh, were, are, are dwarfed by the surrounding subdivisions in O'Fallon and Lake St. Louis in this case. Now, we don't know, we haven't done the research with the recorder of deeds office to find out if there are recorded documents, agreements between the subdivision and the landowners with these two private residences. Let's do our due diligence not to step on anyone's rights or anyone's toes. I'm all about safety, but I would think that uh, I would imagine that those developers would have made prior arrangements that are on recording with the recorder of deeds office. And I think we need to be very uh, cautious about this. So before we jump to any conclusions, there should be a full staff detailed report and hopefully it will be transparent and the process will be open so every county resident can see all of the affordable data, all the photos and all of the documents to make sure that everybody's included in this process. Thank you. Do other speakers? No. Seeing none, then we'll move on to the public comments. This is a time where anybody can come before the council and speak on any topic. Once a topic has been arrived at, then we uh, alternate uh, three speakers pro, three speakers con, and we ask every speaker to please limit their, their time to three minutes. Is there anybody to speak? Yes, Doug Tiemann. Good evening. My name is Doug Tiemann. I'm an engineer with Pickett, Ray, and Silver, and I'm here to discuss the Bluffs development. And first of all, uh, this is an item that's tabled, and I would like to uh, say that the preliminary plat and the final development plan that we submitted on this project is in conformance with the preliminary development plan that we prepared. We have requested variances to, to improve and preserve the area, the character of the land, and we're disturbing 7.7% of the total site area. The developer has asked us to use new methods and initiatives to develop a community focused on design and development, which will be unique to St. Charles County. I am asking for you to approve this preliminary plat and final development plan. Thank you. Tim Busey. <coughs> Good evening. I too am. Um, Speaking in favor of uh, the Bluffs plan and the care, I want, just want to reiterate the care that the development team has um, taken to address concerns and to disturb the site and the trees as little as possible. I think it's uh, in my uh, history with St. Charles County development, it is un precedented the amount of care that's been taken on this site and I want to urge you to uh, pass it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brad Goss. 
Mr. Chairman, members of the council, again, um, we've presented the BLUFF project to you repeatedly. Uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, but we do think this is a paradigm shifting and setting development. Uh, we think it's very positive for St. Charles County. Uh, we've worked carefully with those who are opposed to it to try and improve it and meet their objections, and we'd hope that we'd find your support. Thank you. Thank you. Arnie Dinoff. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the County Council. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, public advocate and resident. <laughs> First of all, each one of you up on this dais makes $1,000 or more in expenses, salary, cell phone, medical benefits, plus a pension. And you're vested after five years in the logger's pension. Now, at the last meeting, a lot of you cut off speakers who were speaking about the bluffs, and I think that was wrong. You want to cut speakers to six for and six against on any given subject, but yet you're making over $1,000 a meeting with expenses in addition to a pension. This is not the country club mentality of uh, entitlement, gentlemen, as there's no women on the council. Mike Klinghammer is leaving, who established the loggers on this council, and he left because he's getting a six-figure salary with the city of St. Charles, in which it's the best three years, average of the best three years, he'll be getting probably a, a eighty dollars to $85,000 pension for the rest of his life when he's done with the city of St. Charles. And that's kind of wrong. It's about entitlement up there. Um, you really negated and didn't hear from the people who were against the bluffs, the thousands of people out there on Facebook, the thousands of emails and communication about against the bluffs. Um, thank heavens that Mr. Klinghammer isn't here uh, to uh, vote in favor of his friends, the Whitaker kids, you know? So he doesn't have a vote any longer. As at last Friday's meeting, I told and testified on the outrageous spending of the county administration and the county council to the Missouri House of Representatives Committee on Taxation. And I spoke about the lie stated by Vicki Husselman, the $80,000 special assistant to County Executive Steve Ellman. You know, it's, it's about priorities here, and we need to make sure that we're doing the right priorities instead of spending $10 million on a gateway green rate project that fails, and that's uh, a, a pork belly project. Paying the director of administration to my right, $194,000, $74,000 more than the director of administration for the state of Missouri with 55,000 employees and 20 departments. We only have 1,100 employees. The assistant directors to my right make $130,000 plus benefits and pension. And then you hire Chris Hunt as a captain, moving from patrolman to a captain who violated Amendment 4, search of a, of a without a warrant Mr. of Chairman, a resident. Mr. Chairman, Amendment 8, Mr. civil Mr. rights Mr. between it's and beat a human being in handcuffs. On any member he was convicted by a jury in Montgomery County of felonies and then entered a plea of a misdemeanor for trespassing, unlawful entry, and peace disturbance, but yet you gave him triple the amount of salary. And now Bill 4748, application PR 1903 for Missouri Bluffs. Remember the way that you vote, and you cast your vote will be remembered in 2020 and 2022. I ask that you vote no on the bluffs. It's bad for our county. Buy the property and make it a public Time's park. Up. Thank you. Thank you. Kara Elms. And you're thinking, really? I get to speak now. <laughs> and I'm the worst public speaker, so I'm just letting you know. <laughs> Gotta be positive. Well, right? he is too, so go ahead. Oh, you probably won't like what I have to say, but you know, hey. Okay. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, my name is Kara Ellums. I'm a resident of St. Charles County, and I'm here to speak on Resolution 19 um, 04. Uh, I just heard about it today. Uh, the resolution recognizes and supports the St. Charles County Police and other police departments, sheriff departments, and responders in the regional area. Um, I'm not really clear on what the intention of the resolution is since there seems to be a great support from cities and counties for the police. It seems that you want to point out that an officer's job is hard due to the increased public scrutiny, me media attention, and video recordings of the officers. I do agree that the officer's jobs um, have become increasingly difficult due to these things, 
but the focus should not be on blindly supporting the police officers, but rather looking on ways to improve relations between the police and the communities. Um, I'm going to kind of go into my situation um, with police and kind of what I have the viewpoint that I do. Um, my situation actually involved the city, not the county, so I don't want to, you know, say that it was county police, so it was city police. Um, and it's been extremely frustrating, and an open dialogue has not been established, thus creating distrust and dislike for the police. My 10-year-old son was injured while attending cops camp through the city of St. Charles, and my family was left with over $3,000 in medical bills. I fully believe that this situation could have been prevented by a police officer not bringing over 40 campers in a small hallway filled with objects such as filing cabinets, chairs, mop buckets, and ladders. But the real crux of the matter lies in how the city responded. The message that I have received is that you signed a waiver and we are protected under sovereign immunity and official immunity. There was no dialogue between the city as I was handed off to a third party administrator. Blindly passing resolutions that recognize and support police officers does nothing to solve the issue of police officers not feeling secure to make decisions at their job. It might boost their ego a bit, but this does not address the real problem. Why do people distrust the police? Why do people so quickly jump to conclusions? Why do people feel the need to record police interactions? I try to consider both sides of the story in most situations in life. In passing the resolution, you only consider the viewpoint of the officers and that, not that of the public. Instead of passing a feel-good resolution with no action, I encourage you to come up with a solution to bridge the divide between the police and the citizens that they are sworn to protect. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, she was a no other speaker. speakers? Okay, saying none. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I see our prosecuting attorney here. Uh, Mr. Lomar, would I'm you? I'm filling out the form, but if I, if I may. Yeah. Please, come sure. forward. Well, I think the chief and there are some others. Scott wanted to speak, too. I think they're waiting to, but if, yeah, okay. that's fine. Yeah. Chief Go ahead, Tim. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the council, I, I won't take too much uh, of your time. I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. I have a different perspective um, that I'd like to share with you guys. I, I work closely with uh, not just our county police department on a daily basis, but also all the other departments in this county. Um, I see firsthand what they have to deal with on a daily basis. I see the body camera videos of the crime scenes that they have to approach and deal with. I see the um, dangerous situations they find themselves in uh, every day uh, with weapons in this county, with dangerous people in this county, people who don't care about the consequences of their actions. These guys are what make our county uh, the safe place that it is. Uh, I tell people this when I talk in public all the time. St. Charles County is unique in many ways, one of which is that the vast majority of our population moved here from somewhere else, whether that's other parts of the metro area, other parts of the state, other parts of the country. One of the primary reasons they did that is because this is a safe place to raise your families. It's a prosperous business community. We have good, safe neighborhoods, good, safe schools. We want to keep it that way. Our police officers in this community do that for us in ways that the vast majority of us will never, ever know. Uh, the least we can do, uh, this is more than just a feel-good resolution. This is a public showing of support for the people that make our community what it is. And we in St. Charles County, in my opinion, and based upon my interactions with other folks in the law enforcement community, not just in St. Louis metro area, but across the state, we are looked at in many ways as models as to how we are supposed to treat uh, our law enforcement community and how we interact uh, as law enforcement and as members of the community. So based upon that, I, I highly urge you, and I, I think it's a wonderful idea to uh, pass this resolution, and uh, I'm very much in support of that. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I'd like to acknowledge Chief DiGiuseppe from the Lake St. Louis Police Department here. Chair, Sheriff Scott Lewis. Um, I don't know if this is necessarily a feel-good thing, but on behalf of the law enforcement agencies in the region, uh, they certainly appreciate it because they're doing the job that nobody else wants to do. We don't see people getting out of bed the middle of night and responding to, these, to many things. Do we make mistakes? Sure. The problem for law enforcement is we draw from the citizens that we are. There's no magic factory that law enforcement comes from. We're your neighbors, your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, and we'll make mistakes, and we do make mistakes. And we're called accountable for those mistakes. 
but the public has chosen us to call others into accountability for the mistakes they make for the laws that the public has chose to publish. And we try to do the best job we can and we take it day by day. So on behalf of all the regional law enforcement, Chief Giuseppe and the Sheriff, we thank you. Very good, thank you, Chief. I would just echo what the prosecutor and the chief said. Uh, uh, I'm a member of the Cottleville Weldon Spring Rotary Club and just last week um, we went around the room and had to talk about our business and how can the club members help us with our business. And I kind of jokingly you know, said, don't commit a crime. You're going to help me. <laughs> and uh, you know, now, you know, after I read the paper and you know, the last week, you know, what I wish I would have said was continue to provide the support that you provide to our police departments in this county. We, like Mr. Lomar said, are very fortunate. Um, we've been supported by our elected officials. We've been supported by our community, by our prosecutor, and uh, we appreciate uh, you taking this step today to uh, pass this resolu resolution. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We kind of jumped ahead of our agenda, but that's fine. Uh, we move on to, if there is any, anything else, then we move on to the oral report by County Executive Element. I would just add my support for the resolution. Uh, I uh, served on a lot of committees in Jefferson City on, on the judiciary and uh, uh, civil and crim, and talked a lot about law enforcement. Uh, but until I became a judge, I didn't appreciate how difficult their job was. And I saw some of the people that they had to deal with, not only on the streets, but our, our folks in corrections in the jail. And um, the, the kind of behavior they deal with on, a, on an everyday basis, you, people don't see it on TV. Uh, I wish they did and they'd understand better what a difficult job they have. Mr. Chairman, the only other thing I have is uh, I think at the last meeting, uh, do, you, do you want to go ahead and do that? Yeah. There, there was a question asked about uh, something in the budget and we went ahead and uh, Bob Schnurr got the answer to that. He's not here, but uh, John Grice is gonna go ahead and explain. Bob's here. Bob's here. Oh, you are here? Invisible Bob. <laughs> oh, he just got back? John's got a report. Uh, they told me yesterday you wouldn't be here, I'm sorry. <laughs> He likes to sneak in. All right. Mentally, Bob is elsewhere right now. He's on a beach. So. so the question that was asked was brought up by Councilman Cronin, and he asked about the park capital plan. And he pointed out something that was, um, at the time, we didn't provide an adequate answer. And I just want to make sure that we got that answer to the council. What he pointed to was that we have 13.9 million in 2020 for capital expenditures, and then that in subsequent years, you see that that number drops down to 1.6, 1.7 million. What happened is when we put the capital plan together and those out years, all we picked up was the $1 million that we had in land acquisition and about six to 700,000 in capital improvement that was used for replacing the weed eater, the lawn mowers, the trucks, all of those basic equipment needed to keep our parks running and functioning. What's not included in there, that's included in the 13.9, is our park development. And as you'll remember last year, the council requested a copy of a strategic plan that laid out when are we gonna develop each park? When are we gonna invest and make new improvements to New Melly? When are we gonna invest additional money into a Klondike Park? And all of those big projects that are new features to the park, that did not carry, get carried over into the out years of the capital plan. So I just wanna let you know that that's the difference in the two numbers is that what you see at the 13 includes the new and fun stuff in 2020, but in those out years, all it includes is land acquisition and replacing what we have. When we get to the point of budgeting money, and we talk to the council again about the strategic plan this year, at that point you'll see those additional monies for development come into the budget. Any questions? No. Thank, Thank you. you for Thank you for clarifying that. Anything else, Mr. Elman? No, okay. They will move on to the oral, the uh, consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 That consent agenda has been approved.
And with that, we move on to uh, resolution number 19 04. I, I feel very strong about this resolution because it's close to my family. My son-in-law and my daughter are in law enforcement. My daughter served undercover for several years. And as a father, I know how scary that is to have a loved one doing that type of work. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of other parents that are parents of law enforcement that feel the same way I do. So I'm very proud to bring this resolution forward. Thanks, John. I just a couple comments. <clears throat> the reason why uh, we had this conversation among the council members, and uh, by the way, Donna, I don't know if I take a motion, but this will count as a whole. Me and John was trying to get this put together, and I apologize to the council members for not getting your names on it, but they would like their names on it as well. Um, <clears throat> the reason why this is important to St. Charles County and the metropolitan area, if you know, it goes to the St. Louis, St. Louis County, and the metropolitan area, is because we're one community. And what we see so often, this is not a, a resolution saying blindly uh, support the police. That's not what we're saying at all. There's bad policemen, there's bad lawyers, there's bad mechanics, there's bad doctors. And that's just the way the world is. And you, have to, you do have to watch everyone. However, in the, in the, in the, right now what we're seeing is, um, if you read this, or, this resolution, it says, one of the whereas is the public often draws conclusions regarding an officer's actions without appropriate awareness of the circumstances or the incident. How often do we see where there's a, a police involved shooting and instantaneously there's elected officials in St. Louis that want to go right for the prosecution. They, let's, let's, let's look at assault. Let's look at prosecuting them. Let's do this. In the, in the post-dispatch in recent days, the, the, the front page said, police officer shoots man from having marijuana. Something to that sort. Well, that's not why he shot him. He shot him because he pulled a gun on him. But it's the negative rhetoric that we hear over and over and over again that creates problems for our community. It creates an uncivilized community, and it creates lawlessness. Do the, do the, I hope the people in this community understand that in the last five years, the police murder rate has went up 35 percent. Now, is that because of the negative rhetoric? It could be. You got, you got police officers in New York City where they're throwing buckets of water on them. Do you think to, that when young people see that and think that's okay, that, that that doesn't draw a negative conclusion for a civilized community? If we continue to let this rhetoric continue and this negativity continue towards police officers, we are going, it, it, it also says in here, it often, um, Recent studies by the Manhattan Institute and others have warned that crime will begin to rise as officers become less willing to initiate a contact with the public. Any logical person would tell you, if you're a police officer on the law, in law enforcement without the elected officials, which there are several elected officials in St. Louis that are extremely negative and anti-law enforcement and anti-police, do you think if you got your, you're trying to support your family and you got your pension on the line, you are not going to do anything? to take a chance with someone charging with a crime. In recent weeks, we had a police officer charged with assault for spraying a rioter with pepper spray. Now, no one knows what the circumstances were. Maybe it was he got in the midst of all kinds of other stuff, but, and things happen. When you're in, and you could have, it could have been a photographer. Whoever it was who got sprayed, it was an accident, or it wasn't an accident. Maybe he deserves to get sprayed, but does that police officer making a split second decision deserve to get charged with assault? from the prosecutor, you have elected officials that are charging police officers, accusations, charge them at a minute's notice without knowing the facts. The, the gallery shooting, same thing. The guy had a clip on him, he had a gun on him, he ran from police, he pulled an, a, 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 a weapon and he got shot and killed. Those are what happen when you, that's what happens when you pull a gun on a police officer. And all the rhetoric, all the negativity, all the, let's, let's investigate the police. It's just the negativity is going to create complete lawlessness in the city of St. Louis. Complete lawlessness. And we are a community. We're all part of the same. Just because we live in St. Charles County across the river doesn't mean these issues concern us. They do concern us. And people need to start watching this. And I, and I understand what you mean, ma'am, that you spoke, you, you can't, there's I, an unfortunate incident with your child and I, I, I'm not even, I don't know what happened. But the fact is, is 
in every institute, every situation, there's bad people who, there's people who aren't as good as others at what they do. But let's not just draw a conclusion. It's being negative and it's being biased in, in a negative fashion and it's bad for the community. So that's why this is so important because our police, we want our police officers to know that we support them. We support them with the reason of law and we support them. We don't want them to withdraw and go put in their eight hours sitting in a parking lot playing on their phone because that's what these other cops are gonna do in St. City of St. Louis because they're just simply afraid they're not gonna get back up. They're gonna get accused of doing their job and that's why it's a problem. It's creating a very negative atmosphere. Anyone else? I would just make um, a quick comment. I don't have the stats in front of me and we don't have it in this resolution, but I think it's something that's important to note. Um, the suicide rate among police officers is through the roof and it's really gone up exponentially over the last five years. And I think a lot of it is because of a lot of what you're talking about. Um, I mean, the thing that I saw in New York with the police officers walking down the street and people just walking up and throwing things on them, and you, you kind of hoped it was water after a while because you don't know what could have been there. And those guys couldn't do anything because they felt like they couldn't do anything. They felt like they weren't supported. And I think that's what leads to the suicide rate that goes up there. So um, I understand what you're saying in your public comments, and I'm sorry to hear about your situation, but I think the broader point that we're trying to make is we want our law enforcement officers to know that at least in St. Charles County, your elected officials are here, that we have your back. Um, we appreciate the job that you do every day. We know it's hard. And uh, to Chief's words, people are not lining up uh, to say put that badge on my chest and send me out in harm's way. Um, there's a commercial for the Marines, which I know you'll appreciate this because you're a Marine, but it's not just a Marine thing. Uh, there are some people who run into the fight. There are some people who run away. And I am thankful that we have people who are willing to put that badge on and to run into the fight because that, what, that is what makes our county safe, secure, and it makes us to have the peace that we feel at night. I mean, the majority of crime that we run into in many of our neighborhoods, not all, but in many of our neighborhoods is because we left your garage door up or you left your car unlocked. Uh, lock your car, put your garage door down when you go to bed at night, and a lot of the crime in your neighborhood is going to go away. We're lucky that that's the kind of message that we need to say in our communities. Um, but we need to let our officers know there's other things that you need to do. There's other situations where you need to make those split second calls. And we're here to hear your side of the story and we're here to have your back. And I hope that's what people understand with this resolution. I hope that's what comes across. But uh, thanks to all our law enforcement from all parts of our county for everything that you do. Well said. Um, <clears throat> Jerry, did you want to say anything, or did you uh, have any comments? I think you said it all well. I think the important thing is, is that um, our officers know every day and have seen over the years that this council, this county executive, has sent them out to do the job. And when they've done that legally and ethically, we've supported them when there's been a problem. Very good. If there's anything else, we'll read the title and call the roll. County Police and other police departments, sheriff departments, and responders in the regional area. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Very good. Uh, resolution number 19-04 is passed, and we'll move on to resolution 19-05. Resolution number 19-05, sponsored by Council as a whole, a resolution recognizing September 17 through 23rd as, as Constitution Week in St. Charles County, Missouri, whereas the St. Charles chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution has been in existence since 1909, and whereas this chapter has a Constitution Week committee with goals to preserve the past, enhance the present, and invest in the future. And whereas the Daughters of the American Revolution wish to educate all citizens, especially the youth and newly naturalized citizens, about our founding documents and encourage all in the community to protect and defend the Constitution. And whereas the Daughters of the American Revolution started a tradition of celebrating Constitution Week many years ago. And whereas in 1955, the Daughters of the American Revolution conveyed a petition to Congress to dedicate September 17th 
through the 23rd as Constitution Week. And whereas the United States Congress adopted such a resolution and President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed Public Law 915 on August 2nd, 1956 to establish such an observation. And whereas during this time, we remember that the Constitution is a living document that guarantees the freedoms Americans enjoy. Now therefore, be it resolved by the County Council of St. Charles County, Missouri as follows. Section one, the St. Charles County Council hereby proclaims the week of September 17 through 23, 2019 as Constitution Week in St. Charles County, Missouri. Section two, the St. Charles County Council hereby further asks citizens to reaffirm the ideals the framers of the Constitution had in 1787 by vigilantly protecting the freedoms guaranteed to us through this guardian of our liberties. Yes, I'd like to, uh, uh, again, appreciate what you folks do. Uh, I was an American history teacher for 34 years. <laughs> I did a little math here. I taught the Constitution somewhere between 150 and 175 times during those 34 years. And it was a privilege and an honor and a challenge uh, with 16-year-olds to do that. But I, we certainly appreciate what you, what you folks do. Council Chair, would you like me to read the title and call the roll? Resolution 19-05, a resolution recognizing September 17 through 23rd as Constitution Week in St. Charles County, Missouri. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. I was very proud to sponsor this. Uh, my father did some 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 genealogy research and found out that we had a couple members in a Revolutionary War. So he signed me up as Sons of the American Revolution. I'm very proud of that. Thanks to my father and thank you ladies for very much for all the work that you do. Seeing that, we move on to uh, bills for final passage, starting with Bill 4755. Bill number 4755, an ordinance creating a new chapter of one, chapter 170 of the Ordinances of St. Charles County, Missouri, OSCCMO, relating to the St. Charles County Port Authority and Port District. Mr. Allen. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to amend bill number 4755 and replace it with substitute bill 4755. Bill number 4755 requires an amendment by substitution due to various changes in the original language. Very good. Second. second. Was there a second? Yes. There was. Yes. All, there, all those in favor say aye. We don't aye. do that aye. at those this that point. We ask if is there any discussion or amendment of the substitution a council member would like to offer at this time. Is there any discussion on the amendment at this time? Seeing none. Then all <coughs> in favor of the substitution. All in favor of the substitution. Aye. 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 Those opposed? Substitution passes. Now we move on to the bill itself. Exactly. Substitute bill number 4755, an ordinance adding a new chapter 170 of the ordinances of St. Charles County, Missouri, OSCCMO, creating the St. Charles County Port Authority. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Bill number 4755 has passed. And we'll move on to bill number. Can I just make a quick yes, comment? Yes, sure. I, I want to thank Mr. Brazel for um, revisiting this. I want to thank the county executive and the county staff uh, and some members of the audience who now work for county government who didn't when we started doing this. But uh, I really appreciate everybody. I know I've been banging a Port Authority drum for, I guess, about three years or so now. Uh, so I'm really super over the moon. All the other phrases that you want to throw into excited about the fact that St. Charles County is going to apply for a port authority uh, to the state. So it's not done yet, but I appreciate getting this step done and hopefully we'll be able to recruit some of those monies that leave St. Charles County and can come back to help uh, fuel some great projects in our county in the future. So I'm looking forward to it. And I appreciate everybody who voted yes on this. Thanks. Very good, very good. Okay, as I said, Bill, 19, um, 
Bill number 4755 is passed. We'll move on to bill number 4756. Bill number 4756, an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute amendment number 01 to program services contract with the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services for enhanced opioid surveillance toxicology testing reimbursement. Any questions or comments on bill 4756? Seeing none, read the title and call the roll. An ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute amendment number one to program services contract with the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services for enhanced opioid surveillance toxicology testing reimbursement. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Bill number 4756 is passed. We move on to 4757. Bill number 4757, an ordinance authorizing execution of documents for and receipt of grant funds up to the amount of $330,000 from the Missouri Division of Workforce Development and further amending ordinance 18-117 by providing related supplemental appropriations to the budget of the Workforce and Business Development Fund to administer a new apprenticeship program in partnership with Franklin Apprenticeship. Any questions or comments on bill number 4757? Scott, do you have anything you want to add to this? Thank you. <laughs> well said. <laughs> An ordinance authorizing execution of documents for and receipt of grant funds up to the amount of $330,000 from the Missouri Division of Workforce Development and further amending the Ordinance 18-117 by providing related supplemental appropriations to the budget of the Workforce and Business Development Fund to administer a new apprenticeship program in partnership with Franklin Apprenticeship. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Bill number 4757 is passed. We'll move on to Bill 4758. Bill number 4758, an ordinance amending sections 277.510, 277.920, and 405.5072 in the ordinances of St. Charles County, Missouri, OSCCMO, relating to medical marijuana land use and safety regulations. Any questions or comments on 4758? Seeing none, read the title and call the roll. An ordinance amending sections 277.510, 277.920, and 405.5072 in the ordinances of St. Charles County, Missouri, OSCCMO, relating to medical marijuana land use and safety regulations. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Bill 4758 is passed, and we'll move on to bills for introduction, beginning with 4759. Bill number 4759, requested by Mike Hurlbert, sponsored by John White, an ordinance amending the zoning district map of the County of St. Charles, Missouri, by rezoning land from I-1 Light Industrial District with floodway fringe and density <coughs> floodway overlay districts to I-2 Heavy Industrial District with floodway fringe and density floodway overlay districts as per application RZ-19-10. Any questions or comments on Bill 4759? Well, I mean, since there's nobody representing District 1, do we know what the, um, Dan, who, which one of you guys are, Fred or Mike? Yeah, Fred. Do you want to, do you come up here real quick? Get Fred up there. <laughs> Fred, <laughs> yeah. Did you mean Senator Dyer? Uh, Senator Dyer. Senator Dyer. Fred, just, Fred can tell you about just, the original board authority. You can just, <laughs> Mike, we'll just tell us, what, what, what's the purpose? Problems. What are you guys going to do with he, this? He, uh, Fred owns a trailer storage down the road. He's full. He's uh, got a contract to purchase another piece of property, 22 acres. It's zoned I-1. I-2 allows his type of use. So he's going to have uh, a new facility uh, right up the street. Go ahead, Fred. Yeah. Yeah, I have heavy industrial zoning on my property now, and then the city sewer district is the next piece of property, and so I'm requesting the same for this property, which is adjoining. Okay. Very good. Yeah. It's I I one to I two, and in. Uh, no, I just didn't know if it was going to be like a chemical plant or. Oh no, no, it's <laughs> it's over road trucks mainly. <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah, parking. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. that's got it. I got it. we got it. The train. Mr. Chairman. Yes. yes. I just want to tell Senator Dyer, if anybody asks, we're not bringing back Darby's ditch. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm not trying to bring back Darby's ditch, but I did get a little water through my ditch there. <laughs> We've got a lot of water. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. All right, very good. Thank you. 
If there's any nothing else on 47 and 59, we'll move on to 4760. Bill number 4760, requested by Mike Hurlbert, sponsored by John White, an ordinance amending ordinance 18-030, accepting plans and specifications, ordering, ordering the improvements be made, setting forth a proposed assessment role, and authorizing interim financing for the improvements for the Saratoga Heights Sanitary Sewer Neighborhood Improvement District. Any questions or comments on 4760? <laughs> Seeing none, we'll move on to 4761. Bill number 4761, requested by Craig Tykowski, sponsored by Council as a whole, an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute surface transportation program agreement yes. award name number STP-7302678 with the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission for reimbursement of 80% of eligible costs up to a maximum amount of $1,020,000 to reconstruct part of Gudamuth Road. Any questions on 4761? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, we'll move on to 4762. Bill number 4762, requested by Dr. Mary Kay, sponsored by John White, an ordinance authorizing execution of documents for and receipt of grant funds up to the amount of $5,750 from East West Gateway Council of Government's Financial Assistance Subaward Agreement, Project 2017 UASI Equipment and Supplies, and further amending Ordinance 18-117 by providing related supplemental appropriations to the budget of the Office of the Medical Examiner. Any questions on 4762? Seeing none, we move on to 4763. Bill number 4763, requested by Michelle McBride, sponsored by John White, an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute a sixth amendment to the intergovernmental agreement with the City of St. Charles for collection of taxes. Any questions or comments on 4763? It's always good to see Michelle. Thanks, Thanks for coming to visit. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Seeing none, let's move on to Bill 4764. Bill number 4764, requested by Michelle McBride, sponsored by John White, an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Weldon Spring for collection of neighborhood improvement district special assessments. Any questions on 4764? Seeing none, let's move on to Bill 4765. Bill number 4765, requested by Honorable Joel Brett, sponsored by Council as a whole, an ordinance amending section 160.090, Ordinances of St. Charles County, Missouri, OSCCMO, regarding court costs. Any questions or comments on 4765? Seeing none, we'll move on to Bill 4766. Bill number 4766, requested by Dave Todd, sponsored by John White, an ordinance requiring the fingerprinting of licensees in specified occupations for criminal history record information from the Missouri State Highway Patrol and Federal Bureau of Investigation. Any questions or comments on 4766? Seeing none, we'll move on to 4767. Bill number 4767, requested by Robert Schnur, sponsored by John White, an ordinance fixing and establishing the rate and levying of taxes for the General Revenue Fund and for various special funds of and for the County of St. Charles, Missouri, for the year 2019. Be it ordained by the County Council of St. Charles County, Missouri as follows. Section one, subject to a public hearing on this date, the following tax rates are established and levied for 2019. A, for the general fund of said county being for ordinary purposes, the rate is zero cents on each $100 of assessed valuation. B, for the road and bridge fund of said county, the rate is fixed at 17 and 81 hundredths cents on each $100 of assessed valuation. C, for the dispatch and alarm fund of said county, the rate is fixed at <coughs> four and zero hundredths cents on each $100 of assessed valuation. Section two, this ordinance shall be in full force and effect from and after the date of its passage and approval. Any questions or comments on 4767? Seeing none, that concludes bills for introduction. If there's no bills, so we, no table bills come off the table, then we move on to announcements and miscellaneous. I have a quick question for the chief or uh, Joanne or whoever. I saw in your memo that you said you're going to talk about the tow bill. You got uh, other stuff you might add to it later. It said that on that, on that letter that, that we just had on here. My question would be is um, on the second paragraph, it says towing business will be presented to you at the end of the year, and you're going to look, work at some other stuff. Do you remember a couple of years ago when we were working on that where the, if you get your car towed, let's say it breaks down, and, and the tow truck will tow it, and they put it in their yard. And remember the, some of the problems yes. we were having? And we're still having some of those problems. And we're trying to leave it. We've been working closely with Jennifer. Jennifer's been helping us in some of the things we're doing is 
Uh, and the tow, the tow company's been very cooperative because if they want to do business in St. Charles County, and it's helping our other partners from the other agencies, and that's some of the things we're trying to clean up, and this is one of the things. Uh, some of the people are driving trucks. We have concerns about them being with our citizens in the middle of the night. So that's so well, I agree with on these things. So some of the time we address to the Jennifer. I oh. agree with all that, but I'm just concerned about how sometimes they'll lock up your impound your car if it breaks down and they, the hours are like from nine to four or something like that. It's, and people are working and they can't get right. their car and they're charging you fifty dollars a day. We need to look at that again. Well, and we do. And yeah. as, as the lady was here earlier talk about she had an issue with St. Charles saying we get complaints. Uh, and we are on those and we're addressing those with the tow companies and some of them are legitimate some of them are not But some of them are and we're quickly addressing that with the tow companies I suppose if you can continue complaints on county tows, you just quit using them. Basically. Yes, we pull them off the list Yeah, okay, and uh, when we've we've suspended tow companies and they've addressed the issue very cooperatively with uh, Captain Hunt who does a fine job with that and uh, we've reached out to our legal department also, so it's, it, they've been worked out satisfactorily. And everybody's trying to play well because they, they have to over here. So we've had very good luck with this. Thank you, sir. All right. Very good. Thank you, Chief. Any other announcements? Seeing none. Motion to adjourn. So Second. moved. Thank you all for coming. Well done, sir.